Okay, very good morning to everyone. Monday, 4th of November. Hope everyone had a good weekend. I hope any rugby fans have drowned their sorrows by now. Uh, but congratulations to Lewis Hamilton. One off now, Michael Schumacher, being the greatest F1 driver of all time. I'm sure Charlie will be uh, thrilled about that. But um, having a look at the markets this morning, obviously Monday, going to have a look at the, the usual calendar and try and figure out where the potential ebb and flow of the of the next five trading days might come from uh, as you can see always quite busy uh, interestingly later on this evening we're going to get the first speech from Christine Lagarde having taken over now from Mario Draghi as the head of the ECB as her president role so she's not going to be speaking there till a bit later on 6 p.m. Uh, then other things overall uh, US data very much key throughout the week European as well uh, any manufacturing PMIs from this morning, um, these are all final readings, so not looking really for too much of a catalyst from them. Uh, and then obviously you've got an update on Brexit because we get uh, Parliament dissolved on Wednesday as the election campaigning gets fully underway. So before that though, um, we're going to have a look at the charts this morning. We've got some relative risk on atmosphere to proceeding, so equity markets already extending on gains following a positive session overnight in the Asia Pacific region. So fixed income futures are trading to the downside this morning. Uh, if I just change this to the US 10 year, uh, trading down about eight and a half ticks in the bottom right. Buns are down 32. Gold selling off as well this morning with the equity uh, rally. Predominantly all of this coming on the back of continued optimism over the state of the US China trade dialogue from comments at the weekend. I uh, was just having a look at a couple of charts. Gold, just seeing a bit of a down tick. Uh, I was just looking at a trend line from uh, towards the end of last week, just breaking that, coinciding with some of the overnight Asia Pacific price action on the lows, uh, just causing a bit of a run to the downside through 15.13. So uh, just looking at 15.10 spot four uh, as the area where, I'm just going to mark quickly mark up, you had the initial high on the 28th. Uh, touch on the low print on the 31st and also resistance on that same day. So be looking around there uh, as an initial target on the downside if we continue to, to move lower. And then you've got that actual low that we're seeing at around 6 p.m. on the 1st uh, in the wake of the payrolls number uh, at 15.09 and a half. As I said, equity markets still punching up at record highs. If you're looking at some of the U.S. indices, I mean, looking at the daily continuation here of the S&P, uh, obviously last week we saw a meaningful break above the, the previous all-time highs and we just continue to add at the moment, uh, I guess, on the top level macro themes, uh, elimination of any subsequent risk from developing or escalating trade war, at least for the time being. We're in the positive part of that trade war cycle. Uh, that in combination with the Fed continuing to remain fairly accommodative with its third cut executed uh, keeps equities fairly buoyant looking on a more intraday perspective uh, probably the doubt or bottom end of the range around 30 68 and three quarters would be an area of decent support now uh, now that we've made this uh, kind of further push in the overnight asia pacific session kind of gap mild gap up we then rallied up to that point and that's acted as a nice level of support as Europe's come into the market earlier this morning. You can see around here 7 a.m. before then that eventual push up. So I guess from a, uh, again, there's no technical previous historical levels of significance given we're at record territory. So really I'd say the R1, the intraday high and that low point from overnight Asia Pacific European low uh, will probably define the range for the moment. So it could well be uh, and it wouldn't be that surprising to see a period of consolidation somewhat perhaps within that type of range uh, in the S&P 500. Elsewhere, the Dixie a little firmer. Uh, dollar index is up about one-tenth of a percent for the moment. So uh, some moderate downside seen in both major currency pairs to get things underway. Uh, I was just having a look at the euro chart here in the currency market. Um, if we continue to push down we're sub the, the pivot at the moment then there was that area we were looking at last week the market did respond to it quite well uh, this would have been on Friday amid some of the payroll volatility that we had uh, so any further downside be keeping an eye on that secondary level but then also 
uh, the low that we're seeing down here on the first, so which will coincide with around the S1 today. So overall, relative risk on atmosphere to get the week underway. Uh, again, follows on from the uh, the decent payrolls report we had on Friday and the positive session we had overnight in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, just going back then straight into some of the headlines, and then we'll revert back to the calendar to wrap things up. So this is some of the, the things people are talking about. Uh, this is the ongoing trade dialogue between the US and China. Uh, Commerce Secretary Robert Ross expressed optimism that the US would reach a phase one trade deal with China later this month. Uh, President Donald Trump on Sunday told reporters at the White House that a trade agreement, if one is completed, could be signed somewhere in the US. Again, this is because of the delay of meeting that was supposed to happen in Chile because of the civil unrest that was happening at the APEC meeting. Uh, then on Saturday, after a call between the officials, Chinese state media reiterated the nation's core demands, including the removal of all punitive tariffs. For China, they quote said, removing all the additional tariffs is a core concern that has not changed and will never change, even if there is a first phase deal. The core concern should be reflected. Uh, again, Beijing, what do they want? Well, they want the US to do away with any new import taxes due to take effect on the middle of December, December 15th, on goods including smartphones. Uh, and again, that, that deadline, probably reason why we've got this degree of optimism on this trade side, because that is still quite a way off, what, a good five weeks or so until we get to that point, or six weeks. Uh, and obviously the other big risks for markets that may come as well around that time, whether it's the UK general election or the Fed rate decision, all seemingly happening around that mid-December uh, time frame. So all looking good thus far, but I would recommend that as we go through the week, uh, this continues to be a fairly fluid situation. It doesn't take a lot, given that we're in a positive state of mind and where participants kind of focuses on this issue it wouldn't take much then to see a bit of a pullback if things start to unwind in the dialogue between the two nations uh, otherwise having a look at uh, brexit what's the latest here well obviously everyone's looking at the general election now uh, with parliament set to dissolve on wednesday meaning that really that gets fully underway this is one of the polls on the weekend coming out from uh, i believe this was YouGov. Uh, let me get the right one that's the average Westminster. This was the YouGov one. Uh, had Conservatives at 39%, so up three points. Labour were up six points at uh, 27. Lib Dems down two. Brexit Party down six. Uh, so quite interested to see a pretty decent bounce back by Labour here in the latest polling. Um, the one thing, though, and a couple of things to be aware of, the more I read about this general election, the more I think that polls are... Uh, a, a less and less relevant really this time round and the reason for that uh, are kind of twofold one is uh, some interesting things here this was a graphic out of the FT that I saw at the weekend and it was talking about how local battles in 2019 UK election will be tighter than ever uh, and basically the FT have done a data analysis going back from 1918 to 2017 so taking a hundred year kind of sample of all the elections that have happened uh, and typically the median seat has been won by a total vote share of 53 percent and that makes sense because if you think about it I think since the early 1920s it's always been the Conservatives and Labour that have won uh, UK um, general elections but however this time round it's much more divided and why is it divided well that's because of really this uh, UK politics is obviously completely polarised at the moment where all other issues are kind of off the table and really this is a vote of whether people really want to leave or remain. So it's kind of Brexit or no Brexit that really defines this. And political allegiances are the weakest that they've been in a long, long time. And actual uh, political parties, how much of that is really uh, part of what it is that you're voting on, it's really very little what it is as a key issue and what they feel most strongly about is the uh, how people identify with the notion of leaving or to remain rather than their political allegiance to their regular party hence the discussion we had at the end of last week why areas like Wimbledon could be targeted by the likes of the Lib Dems 
And so from a, an average seat basis, because remember, it's first past the post is how a, a UK election works. Uh, they're estimating in this analysis in the FT that this year the median seat could be won as a little as 39% of the vote. Again, given the fact that um, there's a much bigger division between the split of votes between other political parties, including the Liberal Democrats this time round. Uh, they did say as well as many as 15 seats could be decided by winning just less than 30%. And this would be way down on the 53% that we had seen uh, in previous elections. So some quite interesting facts there uh, that I thought I'd share. The other things this week for the UK, we do have the Bank of England interest rate decision coming on Thursday, but I would say this is likely to be somewhat of a, of a non-event. Um, the reason for that is because of Brexit has been kicked down the road again until obviously the end of January 31st, meaning that really there's little that the Bank of England can do in terms of altering or um, policy or their forward guidance. However, they are going to be releasing their growth and inflation forecasts. Remember, it's November, so it's the quarterly inflation report for the BOE. And this is what analysts surveyed by Bloomberg are looking at in terms of potential changes to the outlook. You can see for 2019, 2020, 2021, uh, growth is very much expected to be cut. Uh, in terms of inflation, 2019, 2020, uh, it's kind of unchanged possibly for this year. Uh, just given the fact that we've only got two more months of the year, but then substantial decreases to the outlook for 2020 and 21. So it's, I don't think the Bank of England really is going to be that meaningful event. Uh, and as I say, uh, very much expected is for a downgrade to both growth and inflation forecasts in the latest QIR. Uh, nonetheless, though, Mark Carney will be delivering his usual press conference. So that'll be something we'll be looking out for uh, later on Thursday in the week. The other thing from the UK... Uh, from a news perspective, uh, obviously John Burko is now gone, meaning that the House of Commons will elect a new speaker today. Uh, I think it's pretty much a one-horse race if you're reading the press at the weekend. His deputy, Lindsay Hoyle, is seen as the favourite to win the ballot, according to the bookies. Uh, the Labour MP has framed himself as the antidote to Burko uh, and said his style of using humour can help diffuse tensions rather than rile them as his predecessor was uh, often guilty of doing as uh, some opinion so i guess the question is from a trading point of view does the house does the nomination of the house speaker have any influence or potential for the pound today i'd say no of course the speaker is an important pivotal person because they shape the debate and the hearings that happen in the lower house of commons however not only have we known who the front runner is for some period of time, um, that shaping of the debate really, we already know what the debate is going to be because we have clarity and Parliament's going to be dissolved. So really the election's the focus here, not so much the Speaker. A uh, Speaker may well come into play a few months down the line if Brexit truly is being kicked down the road again, of course. Uh, so that's pretty much the summary of the headlines overall. Uh, going back just quickly then to this calendar uh, to have a look at a few other things. Uh, later on in the session today, you do get um, U.S. factory orders. Uh, from a U.S. data perspective, Tuesday is probably the one that I'm watching with most interest. Um, you get the likes of U.S. trade balance, service PMI, IBD tip, economic optimism. But most importantly, you get the ISM non-manufacturing PMI. Uh, so just given some of the recent string of economic data from the US, I'd be particularly interested to see how that one comes out. Um, otherwise, looking in other nations from a data perspective, you've got the UK service PMI coming on Tuesday. So you get the construction number a bit earlier on um, or later this morning, I should say. Um, you then have German factory orders on Wednesday, German industrial production on Thursday, uh, which also will be quite interesting to watch just given how uh, heavy in contraction the manufacturing sector PMI has been for the German nation. And then on Friday, you get Chinese trade balance and inflation readings to follow at the weekend on Saturday. Um, from an interest rate perspective, do be aware you've also got the RBA, so it's going to be this time tomorrow we'll already know the results because it's going to happen overnight in the Asia-Pacific session. Uh, rates not expected to change uh, from the RBA, but nonetheless worth keeping an eye on the Aussie overnight. Uh, you also get the Aussie monetary policy statement to follow 
uh, overnight on Thursday going into Friday morning. Uh, so that is pretty much it. Not going to speak for more than I need to. So I hope you all have a good week ahead. I'll be around on the desk all day. So any questions, please do let me know. Uh, I'll probably mark up a few charts and just share them in the chat room rather than issue the normal weekly strategy today just to make life a bit easier. Sam not here today. He'll be back tomorrow. So any of the remote guys uh, on stage three, if you just um, message me in trading live, is the best form of contact. All right, guys. Have a good week ahead.